Hello YouTube. In the last video we examined David Lewis's version of modal realism. We saw some of the ways the theory can be applied. But today I'd like to look in a, a bit more detail at Lewis's arguments for the theory. Now I think all of Lewis's arguments can be seen as supporting a kind of general, uh, a more general argument, a general methodological strategy. Uh, he wants to forward an indispensability argument. So uh, in his book On the Plurality of Worlds, Lewis draws an analogy to set theory in mathematics. I'm not sure if everyone watching this will be familiar with set theory, so let's instead talk about numbers. Numbers are very strange entities. What exactly are they? One way we can start to think about numbers philosophically is to ask, are facts about numbers discovered or are they invented? Do numbers exist in the world or are they merely tools that we've invented to help describe the world? We might say, well, look, here are three apples. That's an objective fact. Well, they're not actually apples, they're pictures, but you get the point. But this still leaves us with the question, what is three itself? OK, we have three apples, so, so in some sense maybe three is in the world, but you know, what, what, is, what is three? I can have three apples, three oranges, three cars, three whatever, but what's three just in itself? On the one hand, we seem to treat three as if it's an object an abstract object with certain properties. For instance, it has the property of being the first odd prime number. And we appeal to this object to help describe the world, as when I talk about three apples. On the other hand, it's very odd to think that, th that the number three might somehow literally exist uh, in itself apart from uh, you know, three, three particular things. Okay, that there's somehow the number three as an abstract object just on its own. Uh, and notice that it seems like we don't have to appeal to numbers to describe situations. I mean, rather than saying, here are three apples, we could say, this is an apple, this is an apple, and this is an apple. That would be a bit more uh, convoluted, but we could, we could do that. So in the philosophy of mathematics, there are various different approaches to what numbers might be. Uh, first is, is Platonism. According to the Platonist, numbers literally exist. They exist outside of space and time as abstract objects, and we discover facts about them. Another option is to say that numbers are in some sense mental entities, numbers are ideas in our minds. Along similar lines we might treat numbers as fictions. Um, on this view, mathematical statements such as 2 plus 2 equals 4 are strictly speaking false, but they have a lot of utility for reasons other than truth. This is a huge topic, um, obviously I can't do justice to it here. The point is, there are many other options, uh, you know, th th there, are, there are options other than taking numbers as, as having a literal mind-independent existence. Platonism isn't the only uh, plausible option. One of the most famous arguments for Platonism is the Quine-Putnam indispensability argument. There are different ways of interpreting this argument. Um, Quine and Putnam themselves developed it in slightly different ways. But its basic form looks like this. Uh, we, are we should believe in the existence of those entities that are indispensable to our best theories of the world. Numbers are indispensable to our best theories of the world, so we should believe in the existence of numbers. Um, if you want more detail on this, I have a video on Platonism in mathematics, so go and check it out. Uh, but it's, a, I think, a pretty, a pretty straightforward argument. It's a pretty, uh, pretty simple idea there. Um, we, you know, the, the, we have various theories of how the world, the world works um, in science. Um, we believe those theories, so we should believe in the existence of entities postulated by those theories. We believe in electrons and protons and quarks because our best scientific theories um, postulate them. But similarly, in science, there's a lot of appeal to mathematical entities like numbers. So similarly, we should believe in numbers. So it's a straightforward, um, fairly straightforward argument there. And now this is pretty much the kind of argument that Lewis wants to run for modal realism. So we have something like this. We are committed to the existence, uh, we should believe in, in those entities that are indispensable to our best theories of the world. Possible worlds are indispensable to our best theories of the world. So we should believe in possible worlds. Um, Lewis's uh, argument is that in the same way that numbers are uh, essential to mathematics and hence essential to our best theories, and that gives us reason to believe in them, so possible worlds are essential to our best theories, and that gives us reason to believe in possible worlds. He describes possible worlds as a philosopher's paradise. Possible worlds can solve all sorts of philosophical problems, and if we want to get those benefits, we have to believe that possible worlds exist. So Lewis's strategy is essentially a, um, 
uh, a cost-benefit analysis. Lewis tries to show that the benefits of accepting modal realism outweigh the costs. Uh, so he tries to show modal realism is the best theory because its benefits outweigh its costs, and that should lead us to accept that modal realism is correct, that there really are these possible worlds that are just like the actual world. So what are the costs and benefits? Well, we'll examine the, 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 the costs in the next video when we look at objections to modal realism, but we'll go through some of the benefits right now. First, modal realism allows us to take our discourse at face value. Lewis has a famous passage in his book, Counterfactuals, that I, I quote, I believe, and so do you, that things could have been different in countless ways. But what does that mean? Ordinary language permits the paraphrase, there are many ways that things could have been, besides the way they actually are. On the face of it, this sentence is an existential quantification. It says that there exist many entities of a certain description, to wit, ways things could have been. I believe that things could have been different in countless ways. I believe permissible paraphrases of what I believe. Taking the paraphrase at face value, I therefore believe in the existence of entities that might be called ways things might have been. I prefer to call them possible worlds. Um, maybe that seems like a kind of silly argument, uh, but there are two points I think that Lewis might be making here. First, I think Lewis is suggesting that we already believe in possible worlds. Possible worlds are presupposed by our ordinary discourse. Of course, we don't think about them in the kind of way that Lewis does. But, I mean, we, we certainly do presuppose that there are ways things could have been, that there are possibilities. Uh, Lewis is, what Lewis is suggesting here is all the modal realist is saying is, yep, there really are ways things could have been. Okay, we all accept that there are ways things could have been, that things could have been different. And that's that's just that's all the modal realist is saying. Um, I'm not sure that's going to be entirely persuasive to everyone, but uh, I think that's what that's one of Lewis's points here. Uh, maybe a, a, a more important point that might be suggested by this passage is that modal realism provides the most straightforward semantic theory for our discourse about modality. Um, this is similar to an argument that Paul Benassaraf gave in the Philosophy of Mathematics. I talk about it in my video on Platonism, so again, go, go and see that. But uh, basically, modal realism allows us to kind of give a, a, a uniform semantics. Semantics is concerned with uh, meaning, reference, truth, uh, and things like that. And the point here is that modal realism allows us to analyse the, uh, the meaning, the reference, the truth conditions of modal statements in basically the same way that we analyse the meaning, reference and truth conditions of non-modal statements. So take a simple non-modal statement, Hitler lost World War II. What does this mean and what makes it true? Well, it looks like it refers to an object, namely Hitler, and it refers to a property, namely losing World War II, and it attributes this property to the object. So now consider Hitler could have won World War II. Well, recall that on Lewis's analysis, what this means is that a certain counterpart of Hitler did win World War II. So this statement can be interpreted as referring to an object, uh, namely one of Hitler's counterparts, and a property, namely winning World War II, uh, or more precisely, winning the counterpart of World War II, actually, because obviously, um, you know, if we're using World War II to refer to something that happened in this world, it'd have to be the counterpart. But that, yeah. but the point is, it refers to an object, it refers to a property, and it attributes that property to that object. Take a more complex example. Uh, I think this example was given by John Divers in his book, Possible Worlds. Uh, take the non-modal statement, my car is the same colour as your car. This is saying that there are two objects and these objects share a certain property. We might put it in, uh, in, in a more formal way as X is the same P as Y. Now take the corresponding modal statement, my car could have been the same colour as your car. We can explain the truth conditions in, essentia in essentially the same way as before. There are two objects, one of which is your car and the other is a counterpart of my car, and these objects share the same property. We have, as before, X is the same P as Y, where X is a counterpart of my car. So by, by, talk, by taking our talk of ways things could have been at face value, modal realism offers a very straightforward semantic theory. Um, other views of the nature of modality are unlikely to deliver such a simple semantics. Uh, I mean, if we say, for instance, that 
uh, strictly speaking, there are no possible worlds. The possible worlds are just tools, just human constructions. Then when we say, my car could have been the same colour as your car, it's not entirely obvious what objects and what properties we, we're referring to. I mean, we seem to be talking about possible cars, um, but if we're not realists about possibilities, then obviously we're not that there aren't literally speaking possible cars. Possible cars aren't objects that literally exist, so we can't successfully refer to them. Um, you know, or we might sort of take it as a statement about about actual cars, but then we're dealing with possible properties or whatever. I mean, it, it's 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 difficult. I mean, obviously you can explain modal statements in other ways. It's, the point is just that the modal realist seems to have the easiest easiest time with it. Okay, second. Modal realism helps to explicate various philosophical concepts. We've already seen in the last video how appealing to possible worlds allows us to explain modality and to provide the truth conditions for counterfactuals. But possible worlds have many applications, even outside of modality. Consider properties. Uh, the traditional way of looking at the world is that it consists of objects with various properties. We have an apple and the apple is red. Redness is a property of the apple. Frank Zappa is a man. There's a property of being a man, a property of manness. And that's one of the properties that Frank Zappa has, or had. I mean, he's dead now, but he had it when he was alive. One of the properties of the earth is that it has a mass um, of about... Um, I don't know what the mass of the earth is. That was a bad example. But it has a mass. That's one of its properties. Um, and, uh, and, and so you have an object with a, with a property. That's all perfectly familiar stuff. Uh, but now the question is, what is a property? Take our red apple. Well, we know what an apple is. We can see it right there. But, but the redness, what's that? What is redness? Um, very big philosophical uh, question there. Sorry, there's been a lot of big philosophical questions, you know, what are numbers, what is redness, but it's um, you know, difficult to avoid. So what is redness? Big question. One very simple answer is that properties are simply sets of objects. Redness is just the set of all objects that we would call red. It's a set of all objects that have a particular colour. The property of being human is just the set um, of all of those objects. Uh, beings that we would describe as humans. This is a nice simple theory. Uh, it allows us to, 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 to treat properties as just straightforward parts of the world. In fact it allows us to reduce properties to objects because we're treating properties as just sets of objects. Okay, we just take a bunch of objects and that's a property. Um, so that kind of nicely streamlines our metaphysical theory. We don't need uh, objects and properties to describe the world, we only need objects and properties are, are constructed out of objects. There's a famous problem with this theory, and it's that some properties are coextensive. They're realised by the same objects. This is a famous example from Quine. Uh, consider creatures with hearts and creatures with kidneys. Presumably having a heart and having kidneys refers to different properties. Um, doesn't seem any question about that, but every creature that has a heart has kidneys and vice versa. I'm not sure if Quine's biology is correct here, um, but clearly it could be the case. I mean, it could happen that all and only those creatures with hearts are creatures with kidneys. So if a property is just a set of objects, then having a heart and having kidneys are the same property because they're the same set of objects. But that's just ridiculous. Similar problems arise for properties that are uninstantiated. Um, so as Lewis points out, the property of being a flying pig is presumably different from the property of being a talking donkey. There are no flying pigs and there are no talking donkeys. Um, so if a property is just a set of objects, then both of these properties are the same. They're just the empty set. They're identical properties. So that's a pretty big problem for this seemingly simple theory. But if we accept modal realism, then none of these properties are really coextensive. It so happens that in our world, every creature with a heart is a creature with kidneys and vice versa. But in other possible worlds, there will be uh, creatures that have hearts without having kidneys and creatures that have kidneys without having hearts. Similarly, in other possible worlds, there are talking donkeys and flying pigs, and these are different. So Lewis says, just take a property to be a set of objects from all possible worlds. If we allow the existence of every possible world, this, uh, this, this allows us to preserve this very straightforward analysis of properties as sets of objects. 
Another example of the utility of possible worlds is the metaphysics of events. The world consists of objects and properties, but arguably it also consists of events, objects doing things. Do we need a separate metaphysical concept of an event? Well, on Lewis's view, events are essentially uh, sort of identified with, with properties of regions of space-time. Um, the attack on the World Trade Center was a region of space in New York City that lasted from about quarter to nine to 10.30 on September 11th, 2001. Now, traditionally, construing events as, as sort of space-time regions has the same problem we saw for properties, coextensionality of distinct events. Suppose you have a wheel that's spinning and is at the same time being heated. It looks like those are distinct events, but they happen over exactly the same space-time region. So if events are identified with regions of space-time, we have to say they're the same event. We can appeal to possible worlds to deal with this problem. For one event, we take the set of worlds where the wheel is spinning. For the other event, we take the set of worlds where the wheel is being heated. They overlap, but they're not exactly the same. Um, there are many other contexts where Lewis appeals to possible worlds, uh, but that should give you some idea of how useful they can be in philosophical analysis. If you read a lot of philosophy, you'll see that the concept of possible worlds comes up in all sorts of areas. Uh, now, if we want to appeal to possible worlds to do philosophical work, we need to give some account of what they are and how they fulfil these roles. And I think for Lewis, this is really the primary benefit of modal realism. This is the, the main thing that modal realism has going for it. Because by treating possible worlds as real entities, um, it's perfectly clear how, you know, why they're so useful and how they can do all this stuff for us. Uh, third, modal realism allows us to reduce modal properties to non-modal properties. Modality is a very bizarre thing. Uh, it's one thing to talk about the way the world is, but the way the world could be, or the way the world must be, uh, that's it's difficult to explain um, in, in what sense statements about such features are true or even what such statements mean. Modal realism takes a lot of the mystery out of modality because it, it provides a reduction of modal properties to non-modal properties. The modal facts, the facts about possibility and necessity and contingency, these are really just non-modal facts. So when I say the glass could have smashed, that just means that in some other world a counterpart of the glass did smash. And that's a non-modal uh, event. That's a, that's a non-modal property. That's a non-modal um, fact, right? It, uh, it's just a glass smashing. So it's just like if a, you know, if a glass smashes in this world, that's not, there's nothing modal about that. That's just something that, that has happened. It's perfectly simple. And so the glass could have smashed by appealing to some counterpart in another world. We're explaining the modal in terms of the non-modal. Uh, necessarily 2 plus 2 equals 4. That just means that 2 plus 2 equals 4 in every world. Again, we're explaining the non-modal in terms of the non-modal, in terms of what is the case. We're explaining what could be the case, what must be the case, just in terms of what is the case. And this is a really significant benefit. Um, I mean, modality, to me at any rate, is really one of the most confusing topics in, in metaphysics. So any theory that reduces the modal to the non-modal has a, a big point in its favour. Now, there is a fairly obvious objection uh, to, to what I've just said here, which is that on the possible worlds analysis, we say that uh, possibly P is true if and only if for some possible world P is the case. Um, but possible is a modal notion, right? When we say, we say possibly P is true if and only if for some possible world P is the case. But what, what we're saying here, if and only if for some possible world, well, po possible is a modal notion. So modal realism ends up presupposing modality. The modal realist has to appeal to the notion of possibility to specify what worlds there are, in which case Lewis hasn't reduced the modal to the non-modal. He's assuming modal facts in order to explicate his theory. Um, but, but notice that if we're modal realists, we can actually just drop the possible. And we can say possibly P is true if and only if for some world P. Necessarily P if and only if for all worlds, P is the case. Uh, or P is impossible if and only if there are no worlds at which P is the case. Worlds, as we saw in the last video, are defined in spatiotemporal terms. A world is just a maximal spatiotemporally connected object. So although Lewis calls them possible worlds, he doesn't need to. He could just call them worlds, right? It's, it, possible worlds is just a name. Um, but his account doesn't presuppose modality. 
There is actually a lot, a lot of debate about whether Lewis's analysis presupposes modality or whether it successfully reduces modality. Um, but certainly it doesn't presuppose modality on the surface. Um, Lewis is saying there is an infinity of worlds. Worlds are maximal spatio-temporally connected objects. There's no metaphysical difference between the actual worlds and all other worlds. Actual is an indexical like here or now. We analyse modality in terms of what happens at other worlds or what doesn't happen at other worlds in the case of impossibility. impossibility the impossible is what, what doesn't happen. Um, and so that, at least prima facie, that, that does seem to reduce uh, the, the modal to the non-modal. We're explaining facts about what could have been the case or what must have been the case in terms of facts about in terms of just what is the case. Uh, so um, these are these are the the benefits of modal realism. Now, if we reject modal realism, we have uh, various options. So let's recall Lewis's argument. Right, uh, we, we should believe in uh, entities that are indispensable to our best theories of the world. Possible worlds are indispensable to our best theories of the world. We should believe in possible worlds. So uh, we might try denying premise one. Uh, does sort of does does uh, pragmatic virtue show that a theory is true? Well, I mean Lewis might say, look, why else do we believe that a theory is true? Okay, look at look at uh, look at science. Most of us believe in the entities postulated by scientific theories. We believe that there are black holes and quarks and photons and mitochondria. Why? Well, because the theories that postulate these entities work. Our best theories of the world tell us that there are black holes and quarks and photons and mitochondria. We accept what our best theories tell us about the world. There's, there's, there's nothing else we can appeal to when it comes to determining ontology. So Lewis will say, all I'm doing is applying to possible worlds the same standards that we use for any other entity that we might believe in. Uh, but there are there, there's a lot of room for objections here. There are some pretty important differences between philosophical and scientific theories. Um, I mean, certainly we accept the entities postulated by scientific theories, but arguably that's not just because those theories are the best. Scientific theories have other things, there are other things going for them that, that might justify our belief in the entities postulated by scientific theories. First of all, scientific theories make novel predictions. Take Einstein's theory of general relativity. In general relativity, um, one of the predictions, uh, so in general relativity, a large mass distorts space-time. So the path of any light travelling near that mass will be bent. The light will, um, will bend about twice as much as would be predicted by Newtonian gravity. This was tested and confirmed by uh, Arthur Eddington, who took a photo of the sun during the eclipse, and he showed that the uh, apparent positions of the stars matched the prediction of general relativity. Okay, so that was, a, that was a novel prediction that was confirmed. Another prediction is gravitational redshift, which is that uh, as you move away from a large mass, space-time stretches. Okay, so space-time is sort of compressed by, by the large mass, and, and so as you move away from a mass, space-time will stretch out, and light will obviously stretch out with it, which will cause the light to be shifted into the red, red, redder parts of the spectrum. And that was tested and confirmed by the Pound-Rebka experiment. The point here is that Einstein's theory, like any other good scientific theory, it, it makes surprising and unexpected predictions that could be tested experimentally. And that's a crucial difference between scientific theories and purely philosophical theories like possible worlds. The point of possible worlds is that they help with conceptual analysis, they help us to systematise our knowledge. I mean, they can do a lot of great things, but there aren't any predictions being made here. A second point is that we can interact with many of the entities postulated by scientific theories. We can play around with them, manipulate them. It's not just that theories about photons are useful. We can actually we can do stuff with photons. And arguably, that's one of the main reasons why we should believe in them. There's a lovely quote from Ian Hacking. Uh, he was talking to a scientist who described um, some sort of photon gun that sprays photons. And Hacking said, um, if you can spray them, then they're real. We can spray photons. But we can't interact in any way with possible worlds. That's stipulated in Lewis's version of the theory. Uh, for Lewis, 
possible worlds are spatio-temporally isolated. There's no way of getting from one world to another. There's no way that the beings of one world could manipulate parts of the other. So the first premise that we're committed to the existence of entities of our best theories, well, that's fairly questionable. I mean, it's important that the theory be a good one, but arguably the reason why we believe in things like photons and electrons is not just because not just because of the, the, the sort of benefits of the theory, it's because, say, the theory makes these novel predictions, or it's because the theory, uh, it's because we can interact with electrons and photons. Um, so that first premise is maybe a bit questionable. Arguably, we we don't fix our beliefs about what exists by looking for the best theory. There are other things we take into account. Um, and certainly the entities postulated by scientific theories have many important features that possible worlds don't. Alternatively, we can deny premise two and hold that possible worlds are not indispensable. Uh, so there are, there are several ways we can take this response. First, we can just abstain from talking about possible worlds and try to find some other way of dealing with the various problems that we've examined. Um, in fact, in general, we, we might even try to abstain from talking about modality at all. Um, w. V. O. Quine, for instance, was very sceptical of modality. He felt there was something quite confused about talk of possibility and necessity and so on. I did actually start a video series about Quine's scepticism of modality, but I never finished it. Um, if you want to, I mean, it, it's technical and um, kind of difficult. Uh, but if you're interested, Michael Morris's introduction to philosophy of language discusses it. So check out that book if you want to know um, why Quine was 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 wary of modality. Uh, it's fair to say that very few philosophers want to take this line. Um, Quinean style scepticism isn't really considered very plausible these days. Uh, so the second option is to allow uh, that that we can talk about possible worlds and allow that we can use them to do uh, philosophical work, but we show that we don't we can do all that stuff without believing in them so this is the approach taken by fictionalism fictionalism views talk of possible worlds as a kind of fiction so to say that at some possible worlds there are talking donkeys that's understood as meaning according to the possible worlds fiction at some possible worlds there are talking donkeys it's just like if i say the doctor is a time lord from from the planet gallifrey but what that means, what everybody would understand that to mean is, according to the BBC TV series Doctor Who, the Doctor is a Time Lord from the planet Gallifrey. Um, now, there are various difficulties with fictionalist analyses. Uh, I'll mention just two. First of all, this seems to make possibility uh, sort of too dependent on us. Um, I mean, it's entirely up to us whether or not something is true according to a fiction. We control fictions. We decide what fictions say. If possible worlds talk is simply a kind of fiction, then possible worlds talk could be anything at all. Why don't we say that in some possible world there are round squares? Or that uh, there's no possible world in which Hitler won World War II? It's surely nicer to imagine that Hitler loses World War II whenever he tries to fight it. So, um... You know, so let's just say that there's actually no possible world where Hitler wins World War Two. I mean, the reason why we don't say these things is because, you know, it seems like it's just a fact that round squares aren't possible. It seems like it's a fact that it was possible for Hitler to have won World War Two. Um, so it certainly doesn't seem like possibility and necessity and so on are just invented by us. Uh, and so similarly, then our possible worlds talk. It's a bit dodgy, it seems to... It, it just seems that fictionalism is too artificial, right? So this artificiality is is, is a big problem for the fictionalist. Second, a uh, famous objection is that fictionalism collapses into realism. So uh, a fictionalist will explain necessity uh, in this kind of way. He will say, necessarily P, if and only if, according to the possible world's fiction, at every world P. Um, that should be necessarily P there, yeah, sorry, bit of a typo, but necessarily P, if and only if, according to the possible world's fiction, at every world P, at every world P is the case. So necessarily 2 plus 2 equals 4, because according to the possible world's fiction, it's the case that 2 plus 2 equals 4 at every possible world. That's fairly straightforward. Um, 
you know, P, P is necessary if P is the case at every possible world. That's just the standard possible world analysis. So the fictionalist says um, P is necessary if and only if, uh, according to the possible world's fiction, P is the case at every possible world. Now the trouble is that according to the possible world's fiction, it's true at every possible world that all possible worlds exist. Think about this from the modal realist point of view. According to, the mo according to modal realism, every possible world really exists. The statement, all possible worlds exist, is true at every possible world. Now, yeah, the, the way the fictionalist analyses this is to say, according to the possible world's fiction, all possible worlds exist, is true at every possible world. So, we have, according to the possible world's fiction, at every world, all possible worlds exist, is true. But now notice how the fictionalist analyses necessity. Um, necessarily P, if and only if, according to the world, possible world's fiction, at every world P. So, according to the possible world's fiction, at every world all possible worlds exist is true, entails that necessarily all possible worlds exist is true. Right? To say, to say uh, according to the possible world's fiction, it's, tr it's true at every world that all possible worlds exist, entails that necessarily all possible worlds exist. And that's just realism. Um, that's just standard modal realism. We're just saying that all possible worlds exist. Uh, I hope that was clear. Um, but uh, the, the point is that if we're saying that um, necessarily P means according to the possible world's fiction at every world P, we run into problems because according to the possible world's fiction, uh, at every world, all possible worlds exist. So we end up having to say that necessarily all possible worlds exist, which is just to assert that all possible worlds exist. Um, so fictionalism collapses into realism, according to this, uh, this uh, objection. So uh, if we reject fictionalism, um, the third option is to accept that possible worlds are real, they exist, but say that, that they don't exist in the same way the actual world does. So, so this, this approach um, agrees with Lewis. There are possible different possible worlds, but we can sort of uh, we can treat possible worlds as 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 not not being the same kind of thing as the actual world. We can say that they are abstract in some way. Um, you know, when we when we say that there could have been talking donkeys, well, yeah, this that means just as Lewis would say that at some possible worlds there are talking donkeys, but these possible talking donkeys aren't like real donkeys. They're not made of matter. They don't exist in space or time. They're abstract. Lewis dubs this approach ersatz realism. Um, now there are various options here, and it would require a whole video series to explore properly. But uh, I'll, I'll discuss what Lewis takes to be the strongest form. Lewis thinks the best option for the ersatz realist is linguistic ersatzism, according to which a possible world is simply a maximal consistent set of propositions. A set of propositions is maximal if and only if for every proposition the set contains either that proposition or its negation. To say that at some possible worlds there are talking donkeys simply means that uh, some of these maximal consistent sets of propositions include a proposition such as Frank the donkey is talking or whatever. So um, the, the point is that this allows us to to accept that there are possible worlds. Possible worlds are uh, real things, as Lewis would say, but it's, it seems to be a lot easier to accept than modal realism because they're just abstract. So uh, it, it seems to kind of weigh less heavily on our ontology. It, it seems less counterintuitive than supposing that there are you know, an infinite number of worlds just like this one. Uh, and, and an infinite number of worlds that are completely different from this one, but that, that, that have this sort of same mode of concrete existence. Um, so it certainly seems, it seems easier to accept the ontology here. But Lewis has uh, a few objections. First of all, he objects that linguistic ersatzism presupposes modality. This is because the linguistic ersatzist appeals to the notion of consistency. A linguistic ersatz world is a maximal consistent set of propositions. But to say that a set of propositions is consistent is to say that they could all be true, i.e. it's possible for all the sentences, the propositions to be true. So linguistic ersatzism doesn't really explain modality, it presupposes it. 
Now, I'm a, a, a little bit unsure about this uh, criticism. To say, I would say that to say that a proposition, a set of propositions is consistent is to say that they don't entail a contradiction, where a contradiction is defined as the assertion of a proposition and its negation. Now, possibility, I, I think possibility doesn't need to come into that. Uh, indeed, we could hold that it's possible for inconsistent sets of set of propositions to be true. Uh, dialetheists like Graham Priest think that there are in fact true contradictions. There are incon inconsistent sets of propositions that are not just possibly true but are literally true. So you don't have to define consistency in terms of possibility. Graham Priest certainly wouldn't define consistency in terms of possibility because he thinks there are uh, inconsistent uh, sets of propositions that, that, that are all uh, possible and that are all in fact actually true. Um, but I think that, that Lewis is right that linguistic ersatzism presupposes modality. Uh, the the problem here is that if there are uh, linguistic ersatz possible worlds, there are also linguistic ersatz impossible worlds. A linguistic ersatz world, remember, is just a maximal set of propositions. But there will be sets of propositions that describe impossible states of affairs. Um, I mean, the you know, set of propositions, there can be any, you can have whatever set of propositions you like. Now, the question is, how do we draw the distinction between possible worlds and impossible worlds? For Lewis, on modal realism, there's no need to draw a distinction. The possible worlds are just the worlds, right? Any world that exists is a possible world. The linguistic ersatzist, on the other hand, um, because worlds are sets of propositions, well, he's going, to, he's going to have to accept that there are possible worlds and there also are literally impossible worlds. And so he's going to have to... Uh, define uh, the distinction between possibility and impossibility uh, he's going to have to presuppose it in order to sort his worlds into the possible and the impossible ones. So there is I think still a problem of uh, this presupposing modality. A second problem that Lewis raises for linguistic ersatzism is that linguistic ersatz worlds don't provide enough possibilities. This is because no language available in this world, even in principle, would be rich enough to describe possible worlds with completely alien properties. It seems that there could have been totally different physical laws, totally different kinds of objects and properties in the world. Um, that's surely logically possible. In this world, force equals mass times acceleration. But the world could have been such that there uh, isn't anything like force, and there isn't anything like mass. All the basic properties of this world, you know, force, mass, electricity, energy, heat, uh, if the physics had been completely different, if the basic constituents of this world had been completely different, um, then it, it might have been a world of, of totally alien properties, and rather than having properties like those. Um, but the possibilities here seem to outstrip what any language of our world can describe. Um, Ted Sider provides a, a good example that illustrates the problem. Uh, consider a world with with uh, that has similar properties to our world in general, but in addition contains two alien types of matter, call it A matter and B matter. A matter attracts things that are both negatively and positively charged. So if something has any kind of charge, negative or positive, A matter attracts it. B matter repels both negatively and pos positively charged things. So if we want to construct a linguistic ersatz world for this possibility, we have to describe the roles that A matter and B matter play. We would need a sentence like, uh, there are two uh, fundamental properties, P and Q, such that, uh, number one, neither P nor Q is identical to charge, charm, and so on. So that's just saying that P and Q are alien properties that are unlike any properties in our world. And, and two, uh, it is a law of nature that objects with P attract both negatively charged things and positively charged things, while objects with Q repel negatively and positively charged things. So we'd need, we'd need a sentence like that in our uh, set of sentences for this ersatz world. So that's reasonable enough. And we can say that A matter has property P while B matter has property Q. The problem arises when we consider that A matter and B matter could swap their roles. It could be the case, it's possible, uh, logically possible, that B matter attracts both negatively and positively charged things while A matter repels both negatively and positively charged things. But the linguistic ersatzist has no way to distinguish this world from the last one, because 
we can only specify the content of linguistic ersatz worlds by descriptions, but the descriptions of these two worlds will be the same. Um, I mean, if A matter and B matter existed in the actual world, there wouldn't be a problem because we could just point at those kinds of matter and say, well, imagine they swap their properties. But we can't, we can't point at alien matter or alien properties. We can only capture them by descriptions. And by descriptions, we can't distinguish a world in which A matter has property B and B matter has property Q from a world in which A matter has property Q and B matter has property P. Um, you know the descriptions won't do it. Of course, we're, you know, we we can we can swap the letters, right? But um, I mean that, that's just that's just a, a you know, we can sort of say okay, in this world A matter has property P, and in, in this world B matter has property Q, uh, and in this world we can and then we can say oh, in the other world A matter has property Q and B matter has property P. But you know property P, property Q, A matter, B matter, they're just they're just names, right? So the descriptions in terms of what we're actually describing, um, don't distinguish these two worlds. So there's not enough possibilities to to go around, as it were, in linguistic ersatzism. Um, okay, so that was pretty brief, but uh, suffice it to say that in, in Lewis's view, uh, none of the ersatz approaches have the benefits of modal realism. So basically Lewis's argument is that modal realism has uh, all these theoretical benefits. There are other views that we might take about possible worlds, but these either fail to have the benefits or they have other um, serious costs. Uh, just like fictionalism that collapses into realism, linguistic ersatzism doesn't uh, provide enough possibilities and so on. Lewis thinks that when we, when we weigh up all of these costs and benefits of the various options, modal realism comes out on top. Uh, in the next video we'll look at the objections to modal realism, but that's all for now. Goodbye.